Jezebel, she was talking about doublets and different narratives and different versions of stories in the Bible. And she was making a big deal out of it, pointing out contradictions and which I have more or less refuted some of them. Now, I'm just being equally consistent over here and I'm looking at some set of her scriptures. Take, for example, the Epic Ramayan, which is sacred scripture to them. So how many versions does the Ramayan have? There are over 300 versions of the epic story of Prince Ram, really, for a fact, I never really knew that. And these versions can be found in China, Japan, Iran, Indonesia, and Cambodia, among the others. So, just to be brief, I'll just say what's the mainstream version. So, it's about this guy, Prince Ram, who's also a god in Hindu mythology. He marries some princess called Sita. Sita gets kidnapped by a demon called uh, Ravan or Ravana, who is from Sri Lanka, or rather they used to call him the Lord of Lanka. And then he pairs up with another one of the Hindu gods called as Hanuman on his way. And they go and rescue Sita and Ram takes down Ravana. This is the mainstream narrative. But however, there are different other narratives of the story. <laughs> and some are Indian based, some are Chinese, some are Indonesian, and they all differ in the details. Now, take for example this website, just increase the size a bit. Oops, 200%. So, this thing's talking about four versions. You have the Buddhist version. I'll get rid of this cookie stuff. Then you from Jakarta. There's one without any mention of Ravana, neither does it talk about Sita's abduction. Wow, there you go. The main crux is also not there in their version of the <laughs> narrative. And she has the audacity to poke holes at us. Look at the holes in her narrative. Seriously. And it doesn't happen in Ayodhya. And it's got a completely different narrative. Then you have the Jain China version. Now, the most substantial difference is that Lakshman is the killer of Ravan. Now, Lakshman is the brother of Prince Ram. He killed Ravan. Wow. Tell me about it. And she was complaining about doublets and found that as a problem. Quote, unquote, doublets. Whereas she's got like what in her stories. And this is just the Ramayan. I could just go on and on in my upcoming videos about their Vedas, about their... Puranas, about their Mahabharata, about their Gita. Oh boy, it'll make like the Muslim hole in the narrative sound like nothing. Absolutely nothing. Okay. So here's another difference. Then you have the Gond version. It's an oral narrative that consists of seven tales told in the folk traditions of the tribe. Okay. It also overlaps with some characters of the Mahabharata, for example, Bhim. Oh boy. So Mahabharata is another epic and it's overlapping. In this narrative, Lakshman takes center stage in his pursuit for a bride. Rama is not the protagonist in this version of the Kata. Kata means story, by the way. So that's another version already. Then you have the Thai version. Oh boy. Thailand, even the Thai people have their version. Did you know that Hindus in India? Most of them are very much ignorant about this. The average Hindu is more ignorant about their scripture, their own traditions as compared to your average Christian or your average Muslim. Completely ignorant. They don't even ask questions. And imagine it's considered as Thailand's national epic still taught in some schools in the country. So now that makes me wonder. Did the Hindus in India appropriate some other story to be their own and made their own spin over it, which has now become the mainstream Ramayana? Who knows? It could be concocted if I'm just using Esther Dhanaraj's words. Now, Ravan is not depicted as a demon, but as a learned scholar and a noble king in this version. Wow. So in this version, Ravan is kind of depicted as the hero and not the antagonist. 
Oh boy. And here, so that's this guy, the Deuteragonist of the Steel Hanuman, the monkey god, as I pointed out, whom Ram pairs up with to take down Ravan. Apparently, I mean, Valmiki's version is the so-called mainstream. I say it quote unquote, but over here, Hanuman is not celibate. Of course, in Hinduism, that is in Indian mainstream Hinduism, Hanuman is uh, portrayed to be as uh, some god of celibacy, but over here, he is the complete opposite in this version of it, in the Thai version of it. Just wow, just wow. And she talks about Genesis having different sources. We have people attacking the Bible, the Torah, having four different author authors. Tell them to be equally consistent. And it is the same hypocrites who forsake Christianity and end up joining something like Buddhism or this nonsense, which has got no historical basis, no historical kernels, just made up myth. And they call us irrational. You idiots. Christianity, we have a lot to back up in terms of archaeology and historical evidence and manuscripts and third party attestations from other historians. Seriously. Let's have a look at this one now. Five other Ramayans. Sita as Kali. Oh boy, that's that other goddess. Lakshman as Ravana Slay. Okay, I talked about that in that one and more. Why do they not talk about this? These major deviations turn the social and gender equations of the familial version upside down. Familiar version, sorry, upside down. That is the mainstream version. So just imagine. The Ramayana has different Kirats, and these Kirats also don't agree with each other. <laughs> so, anyway, I'll be taking a break from bashing up Esther Dhanraj, and I'll be focusing more on our master in, in the weeks to come, that other fraud, Rajiv Malhotra. I'll be exposing him too. All right. The Ramayana exists differently. So, Amar Chitrakata version we read. Rama and Sita are siblings in this one. Wow. So, they are not husband and wife, rather they are siblings. So, does that mean, what if the Indian mainstream version ended up concocting stuff about them being husband and wife just to cover up the incest? Who knows? It's a very likely probability that there was incest going on over here. And maybe that other story where they were saying that Ravan was the hero, that could actually be true. You never know. <laughs> and it's the same one, Lakshman as the Ravan slaver in Pormacharya, Lakshman's Agni Pariksha in the Korn Ramayani, Hanuman as a ladies man in Rama Kirti and Rama Kiyan. Oh my gosh. And now if I'm looking at another site, this is our Indian newspaper, by the way. I think it's an Indian newspaper. I could be wrong. Okay. Over centuries, different cultures have looked at the epic in their own special way. I don't think so. By the look of it, I think the Indian version could be the crap version. The redacted innovated version <laughs> who knows anyway this is just a teaser trailer of what's going to come and uh, yeah there are some more things i wanted to point out i'm just going about that concerning the pantheon of the hindu gods okay now i'll just give you a bit of a teaser related to the vedas now, the Vedas are the most authoritative scripture when it comes to mainstream Hinduism, all right? And when I mean the most authoritative, they're even over the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, by the way. And just look over here, within the same Veda, the same Veda collection, they have got different Vedas, such as Rig Veda, Atharva Veda, and, uh, and a couple of others collections. Now, see, in the Rig Veda, in this particular, you could say stanza, it says that Vishwakarma created the heaven and the earth. Same, same one, Rig Veda, 
In this stanza, it says another God says Dattar created the heaven, earth, sun, and the moon. And now look at this one in Atharva Veda. <laughs> says that the best of the God, Aja, became the earth. <laughs> <laughs> and we read in Purusha Sukta that the feet of the Lord became the earth. All these Vedic verses contradict each other. Okay, so Esther Dhanraj, Rajiv Malhotra, how do you explain this? I'm waiting for your response. Please come to this. Okay? You can play at that game. Atharva Veda, 13.16 states that Roheta created the heaven and the earth. A verse states that Prajapati created the heaven and the earth. Another was you, another was in Yajur Veda, that's another Vedic collection, 1430 states that Prajapati prayed to a divine speech and then earth and heaven were produced. Over here, okay, so fine, Prajapati, another god, over here. Uh, Dattar created the heaven and the earth. Prajapati created the universe, that's one verse, but the other verse says that he prayed to a divine speech, to a divine speech. No, the word of God, and then earth and heaven were produced. Oh boy, talk about Islam now. Allah prays for Muhammad. Allah prays on Muhammad. <laughs> Some also say the creation took place after the association of father and daughter mentioned in Rig Veda 1061-5-7. Adi Shankara Acharya writes on this verse. He, the Viraj called Manu, was united with her, his daughter called Satarupa, whom he conceived of as his wife. Yuck! Incest, right over here. Oh boy, from that union, men were born. Yuck! By Shankara on, on Brihadaran Ka Upanishad, Shankara Basia, page 101. That's the source. Teacher Swami Madhavanda. Okay. I've got some more stuff to show you. Now, what is the concept of God in Hinduism? Now, naturally, some people will be familiar with Hinduism would just hear that uh, there exists a big hierarchy of gods where they say that these three are the supreme or the chief gods, uh, Brahma, Vishnu, and Mahesh. That Mahesh is the other word name for Shiva. But is that really so? And then we have the other gods and goddesses. But is this really so? Let's have a look at what their actual sources have to say, shall we? Now in the Vedas, which is, as I mentioned, the most authoritarian scripture, as she likes to straw and the Masoretic text as being the most authoritative, say, Hebrew text, have the Vedas genuinely are the most authoritative scriptures in Hinduism. Now, there are some 33 gods in the Rig Vedas. And number of Rig Vedic hymns, kind of like they are spin-off of, you could say, the Psalms or the devotional songs over here. Indra, the god of rain, 289, which I believe could also be some offshoot or spin-off of, say, Zeus or Jupiter. Then Agni. Soma, Aspins, and where's Vishnu? He's only got six songs attributed to him. Rudra, which is Shiva, may be another name given for him. Even they can't agree on that, by the way. They want to identify him as Shiva. It's only got five songs, five hymns dedicated to him. And, and uh, let's have a look. Where are the others gone? Is Brahma anywhere? Can you see him? No, there's just somebody called a Saraswati, three. I don't see Brahma anywhere. Can you see him? Nope, you can't see him. So in other words, Vishnu and Rudra, two of the three top deities, which we see mainstream Hinduism preaching these days, are statistically insignificant deities as per the Rig Veda. And wait, there is more. So you have different variants of, again, Hinduism, where you had some god called as Brahman, Hinduism version 1.2. And then you have these so-called three supreme gods, Brahma, Vishnu, and Mahesh. Some kind of a, it's not a trinity, by the way. Don't ever think that this is a trinity. All right. These are three separate beings and they're three separate persons. Do not confuse them with the Holy Trinity. 
it's a completely different thing. It's just a crap count of it. And then you have demigods, Krishna and Rama, and, and who are supposedly even supposed to be, I don't know, incarnations of Vishnu. And they also vary. There are 10 incarnations of Vishnu, and even those accounts are vary. Like, how many incarnations of Vishnu? Not how many, like, who are the incarnations of Vishnu? They vary in the details. Okay. So I'll just continue again. So how did these Hindu gods come into being? Okay, now let's talk about their creation account. She wanted to throw jabs at our creation account, right? So now it's our turn. Okay, so this is the source. Bhyadarya Nakha Upanishad, part 5, chapter 5, verse 1. Brahman produced some other god called Prajapati. This is Hinduism 1.0, by the way. This universe was but water, liquid oblations connected with sacrifices in the beginning. That water produced Satya. Now Satya literally translates to the truth. Truth. This Satya is Brahman. Huh? What? Water produced their God, Brahman? So is water supposed to be the supreme God? What the hell? Brahman produced Prajapati. And Prajapati is the gods. <laughs> <laughs> so that water produced Satya, Satya is Brahman, okay, and Brahman produced Prajapati, this one over here, and Prajapati produced the 33 gods, oh wow, <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's continue, so my conclusion since water produced Brahman is this water the supreme being, the supreme god according to the Hindu pantheon, and that water produces Satya, the truth. Satya is Brahman. Who is the truth? Brahman produced Prachapati. Some people want to say that he's Lord Brahma. And then they want to make uh, uh, this stuff. These manifestations of Lord Sh Shiva. Like if that's Shiva or Vishnu. And then you have all these sun gods and all these other different gods. And then you have the forces of nature. Prithvi means the earth. Agni is fire. Vayu is the wind, so you have a god for everything. Antariksha is space. Pratyusha is eternal. Dayus is sky. Chandrama is moon. Nakstrani is stars. <laughs> and these are all their other gods and goddesses among the 33. Okay, two Ashwins. Anyway, I'll just proceed further. You know that Hinduism forbids to eat beef. I wonder where they get that from. But anyway, coming to Rig Veda 6, hymn 17, verse 11. Vishnu cooked 100 buffetos for Indra. That's beef, isn't it? Vardhanya, <laughs> Vishre, Maruta, Sajosha. Anyway, screw that. I'll read the English. So Vishnu dressed 100 buffetos, that is, cooked them. O Indra. For thee whom all accordant Marut strengthen. He Pusan Vishnu poured forth three great vessels to him. The juice that cheers, that slaughters Vartha. So why is Vishnu, who's supposed to be a supreme god, sacrificing to Indra? That just doesn't make any sense. If you're saying Vishnu is one among the three supreme gods and Indra is an inferior god. Wonder why does that happen? Why is he sacrificing to a Bigger deity. Please explain this, Esther. I'm really going to go crazy. I thought that Islam is a joke, but seriously, you guys really have big problems. So Vishnu, God of Mortal, conclusion of the Hindu scriptures. As I said, water produced Satya, the truth. Satya is Brahman. Brahman produced Prajapati. Prajapati produced the 33 gods. And these gods, sorry about the typos, guys. It's not my presentation. These, so I apologize for that. But whoever's produced this has done just a master piece, mastery piece of work. It's a work of art. These guys, I'll just give a shout out to this channel, Sakshi Apologetics. It's an apologetics channel in India, and they have spent years researching Hinduism. 
and coming up with all these things, studying their scriptures, their sources, their scholars, and they have compiled this presentation. All right. And I'd also like to give a shout out also to Yeshua Apologetics. Young man who was, he's got a testimony to share some sometime, God willing, on Adam Seeker's channel. Please keep him in, please keep him in prayers, people. All right. The guy is really struggling and he's got 10 times the courage, which I have. Maybe even 100 times the courage, which I have makes me look like a fake. Please keep him in prayers. Okay. So, and these gods laid down sacrifices according to Prajapati and here after a drunk some and become immortal. Vishnu first compasses the end of the sacrifice. Thus he became the most excellent of the 33 created gods by Prajapati. Now, how can this Vishnu who is a created being be omnipresent, omnipotent and an omniscient god? Tell me. And now you can just see the next spin-off here. Now, as per the Vedas, omnipresent, omnipotent, and omniscient God is alone to be worshipped. According to the Vedas, such an omnipresent, omnipotent, and omniscient God is one. And he alone is to be worshipped by all with a pure heart and noble deeds. The Vedas declare, Ye ek itamu shrusti. Sorry, oh, what's this? Shatuhi Kastonaha. Anyway, I'll just read the thing. O oh man, praise God who is one and the only one and who is the omniscient and omnipotent Lord of all beings. One God alone is to be worshipped by all people. He is adorable. <laughs> one God alone who is giver of all true happiness and bliss is to be worshipped by all. Now tell me, Esther, who is this omnipresent, omnipotent, and omniscient God? It definitely isn't Vishnu. By logic, it can't even be Prajapati or Brahman, or it can't even be Satya. Is it water? Is it water we are supposed to worship? Is that it? Have we got it wrong all this time? Or have you guys got it wrong all this time? <laughs> Why do you worship the worship Brahma, Vishnu, Mahesh and all the others when you guys should actually be worshipping water. Tell me. Okay. Now they say that uh, Vishnu has got 10 avatars or Dashavtar in Hindi or rather Sanskrit. Dashavtar or 10 incarnations. And these are some 10 incarnations. If you look past the names, Buddha happens to be one of them and there's a future incarnation called Askalki who's supposed to be coming. Ram uh, from Ramayan is one, one of them. Then you have Parshuram, you have Balram, Narasimha, Vaman, Varha, Kurma, Matsya. All right. Now you notice that they also say that Krishna is a incarnation of Vishnu. But you don't see Krishna anywhere, do we? So if I skip over to the next slide, give me a second, guys. Now here we can see Krishna, but we don't see Buddha. Come on, people, decide. Which of you guys are the 10 incarnations of Vishnu? You guys can't even tell me that. And how dare you attack the Bible? Frauds. Cowards. Now, just to let you know, in the Mahabharat, this person, woman, Draupadi, she was married to the five protagonists in the Mahabharat, the Pandavas, five brothers, five men. And uh, you know this kind of polygamy, where a woman has multiple wives, it was considered mainstream in Hinduism. And here's the source. <laughs> Vaisampayana said, thus addressed by his loving wife, King Pandu, well acquainted with all the rules of morality, replied, in these words of virtuous import, O Kunti, what thou hast said is quite true. Yushit, okay, sorry. Yushit Thaswa of old did when, even as thou hast said, even as you have said. Indeed, he was equal into the celestials themselves. 
But now I shall tell thee upon the practices of old indicated by the illustrious Rishis. Rishis means sages, fully acquainted with every rule of morality. Now this king, your King Pandu, is talking to his wife Kunti, talking about morality advocated by some sages called as Rishis. O thou of handsome face and sweet smiles, women formerly were not immured within houses and dependent on husbands and other relatives. Okay, so you're saying that wasn't the case where women were in houses and they depended on husbands and other relatives. They used to go about freely enjoying themselves as best as they liked. Take a note of this sentence. This is Hinduism for you. Women used to go about freely enjoying themselves as much as much, uh, best as they liked. Sounds like whoring, doesn't it? Yeah, I'll just read on. All the of excellent qualities. They did not then adhere to their husbands faithfully. And yet, O oh handsome one, they were not regarded sinful. Here, O oh thou of excellent qualities, women did not then obey their husbands faithfully. And yet, he's talking to his wife, handsome or beautiful one, they were not regarded sinful. For that was the sanctioned usage of the times. Women whoring around with multiple men, not being faithful with their husbands. And this is what it's saying. <laughs> Sambhava Parva continued. <laughs> that practice sanctioned by the precedence, where the precedent is applauded by great rishis, by great sages. So this practice, that very usage is followed by this day by birds and beasts without any exhibition of jealousy. So in other words, these cardinal pleasures, which the women used to practice, not being faithful to, to, to their husbands, it's still practiced by birds and beasts without any exhibition of jealousy. Yuck. See how demonic Hinduism is? That practice sanctioned by before, that is precedent, is applauded by great rishis, is applauded and approved by their holy sages. Wow. O oh, thou of Nepotais, the practice is yet regarded with respect among the northern Kurus. Indeed, that usage so lenient to women had the sanction of, had the sanction of uh, antiquity. That means this practice which women used to follow during the times was sanctioned or approved in the olden ages according to the scripture of Hinduism. The present practice, however, of women being confined to one husband for life had been established but lately. So that was a later development. Hmm. I shall tell you in detail who established it and why. So he goes on and narrates the story. It has been heard by us that there was a great rishi of the name of Udalaka, who had a son named Svetateku, who was also of an ascetic of merit. O oh, thou of eyes like lotus petals, the present virtuous practice had been established by that Svetateku from anger. Okay, so there was this guy called Svetateku. Okay. Who was the son of the sage called as Udalaka. So now here's the reason why did this practice get established of monogamy, monogamy among women. One day in the presence of Svetateku's father, a Brahmana came, that is a Brahmin came, that is the Brahmin caste came and catching Svetateku's mother by the hand told her, let us go. Beholding his mother being seized by the hand and taken away apparently by force, rape, the son was greatly moved by wrath or wrath. He was angry. Seeing his son indignant, Udalaka addressed him and said, Be not angry, O son. This is the practice sanctioned by antiquity. Or in other words, this is the practice we have been going on since our rishis said so in antiquity, like in this paragraph, okay, sanctioned by the usage of the times. So in other words, oh boy, if I'm going to compare Islamic muta with this... <laughs> If I was given a false dichotomy to choose between Hinduism and Islam, just a hypothetical situation, I'd rather go with Islam. <laughs> of course, you shouldn't be going with either of them. Christianity is the truth. Seeing his son indignant, Udalaka addressed him and said, Be not angry. This is an ancient practice we have been doing. The women of all orders in this world are free, O son. Men in this matter, as regards as their respect to orders, act as kind. The Rishi's son Svetateku, however, 
Swata Ketu, sorry, however, the disapproved of the usage and established as a practice as regards to both men and women. So this guy changed this practice and introduced monogamy, monogamy into the planet. And uh, yeah, I'm here to do a series on say Hinduism 101 and uh, come back to it some, at some point, God willing. What exactly is Hinduism?